Hi, everyone. This is America Adapts, the climate change podcast. Hey, adapters, welcome back to another episode of America Adapts. This is truly a fantastic episode. I get to talk with experts on two of your favorite subjects, snow leopards and climate adaptation, all in one podcast. In this episode, you will hear many different voices recorded from countries all over the world. You will hear a wide variety of accents, and I just want to give you a bit of context. Most of this will come out in the podcast, but in case it's a little confusing, the snow leopard is found in many Central Asian countries, the Asia High Mountain region. So conserving these species requires collaboration between multiple countries. I have experts from Nepal, China, India, Russia, along with representatives from the U.S. and Sweden. As you will learn, it takes a global village to protect the snow leopard and help it and the communities surrounding the species adapt to climate change. Okay, acknowledgements. This podcast was sponsored by World Wildlife Fund and USAID as part of the Asia High Mountain Project. To learn more about this USAID project, in the show notes, there is a brochure with additional information. So check it out after you listen to the podcast. Just a reminder, America Adapts is a charitable organization that needs your support. Please consider giving a tax-deductible donation. You can find links to the Flip Cause Donate page in the show notes. And to those who have already donated and recurring donators, thank you. Also, if you are interested in sponsoring a specific podcast or having me speak at a public or corporate event, please contact me via the website, americaadapts.org. Okay, upcoming guests. Next up, I have Professor Elizabeth Rush from Brown University coming on to share some of her creative nonfiction writing that focuses on climate change. Finally, in this podcast, the late great author Peter Matheson is referenced frequently for his now classic book, The Snow Leopard. My guests share their own thoughts about that book and how it's relevant to what they are doing to conserve the snow leopard. For those not familiar with the book, you'll learn more about it in this podcast, but the book was about a journey into the remote mountains of Nepal. You can almost imagine yourself exploring these wild regions of the Asia high mountains with the author and legendary field biologist George Schaller. I hope this podcast takes you on a similar journey. Let's see what amazing work is happening to help the snow leopard and the people of the Asia high mountain region adapt to climate change. Hello, adapters. In this segment of the podcast, I'm talking with Ryan Bartlett, lead in climate risk management at the World Wildlife Fund. Hi, Ryan. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, Doug. Pleasure to be here. We are here to talk about snow leopards and climate change adaptation, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, great. So we are, we're kicking off this, this podcast and I, I'm excited to talk about this species. And I think there's a lot of fans of snow leopards out there and I, I want to give them a sense of why we're even doing this episode. So you are the lead of this project. I want you to spend a little time talking about what this whole, you don't have to explain what the whole episode is about, but why we're here talking about snow leopards and adaptation. And you were the lead for WWF on a project focusing on snow leopards. And so can you give a little bit of history of that project and what it's trying to accomplish? Yeah, sure. First and foremost, I should say that I am not a snow leopard biologist. So I'll just get that out of the way for all the potential angry commenters coming at me for not knowing the, the intricate details of snow leopard biology. I but, have some uh, on though. You're, you're covered. They're, they're coming on after you. So <laughs> don't worry about okay, it. Okay, perfect. Then the timing works out really well. Yeah. So the reason that, that we're here today is, is because of a project that WWF has been implementing for the last five years with support from USAID called Conservation and Adaptation in Asia's High Mountain Landscapes and Communities. And it's really all about the intersection between snow leopard conservation, community climate change adaptation, and, and water security issues in Asia's high mountains, what is sometimes called the third pole because there's more snow and ice there than uh, anywhere else on the planet other than the North and the South Pole. And so we've been implementing this project for five years, and it's, it's sadly coming to a close here shortly, both working with communities at a, at a very local scale in these, these remote topographically extreme kind of isolated environments that are right along and sometimes right in snow leopard habitat. And then also working more at a regional level to kind of coordinate 
amongst the different countries that are represented in the, in the snow leopard habitat, snow leopard range, which stretches 3 million square kilometers across uh, Central Asia. So it's a huge, huge area. And we've only really been able to jump into to field work, working directly with communities and, and direct kind of local biology and science uh, and just in a few of those places and a few of those countries. The snow leopard is obviously this beautiful animal, but is there a history with WWF and the snow leopard? Why did you get involved with this project in the first place? That's a good question. So it actually is born more out of the adaptation side of the work that WWF has been funding for a long time in uh, in eastern Nepal in a place called Kanchenjunga, which is a, a beautiful sort of high mountain kind of classic Himalayan landscape in, in eastern Nepal, a very remote part of Nepal, where WWF has been working for a long time. And that was a separate uh, USAID-funded project um, where we were working with communities to help them adapt to the extremes and, and changes in climate and, and unreliable weather patterns and rapid warming and, and melting of, of snow and ice. And USAID came to us on the backs of that work knowing the sort of the, the, the quality of the work that we've been doing with communities there and the trust that we built, you know, saying, here's another opportunity. Do you want to expand this work across the snow leopard range? And also because you're a wildlife organization and you have some history working with snow leopards, do you want to expand it into uh, bringing in more explicitly the conservation angle as well? Okay. This might be a bit of a gotcha question, but it's <laughs> Central Asia. What are the countries that are involved? So we have been working with six of the 12 range countries. Those six are Bhutan, India, Nepal, Pakistan, Kyrgyzstan, and Mongolia. All right, good. And I'm not sure I could name <laughs> name the it. other six, but I could come close. I was cheating and looking at the, the, the summary document that you, you sent okay. me. So I was just sure. checking if you remember no, after fair. all these years. Oh, okay. So uh, looking at the map, though, those are some of these countries, and it, it, it's a spread out group of countries. But right smack in the middle is China. So why weren't they involved? That's a good question. It has to do with, well, partly it has to do with with USAID funding requirements and the the sensitivities of working in in Tibet, which is where the majority of of the snow leopard habitat is. So this this funding was just limited to the, the the six range countries that we could we could easily work in. Doesn't mean there isn't a lot of great snow leopard work happening in in Tibet and in China. And Chinese biologists in particular and the countries focused a lot uh, more recently. Um, but specifically for this adaptation and snow leopard conservation work, it was it was more limited than that. Well, one of the guests for this episode is Wan Li, and she is a Chinese researcher, and she had some great stories, and so. Awesome. We, we get that perspective on what's happening in China, too. So I'm, I'm Yeah, glad. it's a really important perspective. I mean, I'm, they have the largest amount of, of snow leopard habitat of any of the 12 range countries. Um, so it is definitely it's, it's really important to get that. OK, so I'm going to dive into some of the details of the project. But first, I guess I'm more curious. Did you get to go on location for this project? There's these six different countries. Did you get to go to any of those countries? Yeah, I've been to a few of them. I mean, not as far afield as I would like. Usually, and not surprisingly, getting out into the field takes quite a bit of work and, and a lot of days of travel, and I don't always have those opportunities. For me, the field tends to be uh, the, the, the city capitals of, the, of these countries where I'm doing trainings or or you know bringing people up to speed on the latest science how climate change is affecting the, the, their landscapes and then they go back out into the field with that information but um yeah i've been to uh to bhutan and, and nepal and uh kyrgyzstan as part of the part of this work okay i'm asking this of every guest have you actually seen a snow leopard in the wild <laughs> uh no i mean I, I would love to uh but no unfortunately i have not I had a feeling you were going to say that. And Wan Li, the, the Chinese researcher, she's seen one in the wild 10 times. And so you've oh, got wow. a lot of work to do to catch up to her. So well, I'd have to commit myself <laughs> to being a, a, a or to a career change to being a field biologist, I think. I think you and I are just going to have to go fake it at the zoo and, you know, claim credit we saw them in the wild. 
Well, yeah, Planet Earth 2 does a pretty good job these days, too. Okay, so back to the project. We're talking about yeah. snow leopards and adaptation, and you're working in these countries. And it, to me, it's very encouraging that, okay, I think a lot of folks are happy that you're working to try to help the snow leopard deal with the impacts of climate change. But it's a USAID project. In, in the big picture, they have other priorities, too. And you've sort of talked a little bit about that. But... I think someone described this project not so much even as a snow leopard project, but it's a water security project. And so what do you think they meant by that? Yes, it's about it's it's certainly about research into how climate change affects the snow leopard and its habitat. But honestly, we have so little information about the species in general. Um, you know, we don't know what the baseline population numbers are. There's a, there's a huge range from Sometimes people talk about 3,500. Sometimes people say 6,000 to 6,500. So there's not a lot of information about the cat in the first place. And so it's really hard to say exactly how it's vulnerable to changes in climate. Uh, I mean, historically, cats in general are very adaptive to, to climate shifts and especially one like this that, that cuts across such an enormous range. The odds are that it would be able to find a suitable habitat as temperatures rise. That said, and this is why USAID is, wanted us to focus on communities, it's all about the community relationship with those habitat areas. Because we've, we've seen this in other examples around the world, but where if communities in these isolated areas, rural communities, if they're extremely vulnerable to climate change impacts and they're affected directly by those changes, then they tend to also, you know, that throws off the whole balance of the system. So for example, from a totally different part of the world, but a similar type of environment in the Arctic, you know, because summer sea ice extent is changing so much and is so much lower than it used to be in the past, polar bears are spending a lot more time roaming around community villages, uh, Inuit villages, looking for food sources. And that's created new tension between wildlife and, and people, what we call human wildlife conflict. And there's Similar evidence for, for that risk for snow leopards. If snow leopards can no longer find their wild prey, then they tend to spend more time closer to people, uh, killing livestock. And then that leads to one of the, the most detrimental threats currently to snow leopards, which is retaliatory killing, where these, these herders or, or people that spend most of their time out herding livestock in, in high altitude pastures, if their livestock get killed or attacked by snow leopards, and they tend to retaliate and try and go and find that and kill that snow leopard. So really, the lens that we're focusing on is how communities are vulnerable to these these changes in climate and how that in turn affects the species. So that makes that's why it makes even more sense to really focus on on those community vulnerabilities to build resilience there, um, because then that reduces some of the pressures on surrounding habitat and, and species that are important that we care about, like in this case with the snow leopard. One of the tangible outcomes of this project is all this additional research that you've been able to do over the the lifespan of this project. And what what I was reading is that you were actually able to collar a snow leopard. Is that right? We've been able to fund collarings for three snow leopards over the course of the project in Nepal, in eastern Nepal, in that same Kanchenjunga area, um, which has led to some fascinating insights. Um, it really shows you how transboundary the, these animals are. You know, it, it shows it traveling into India and then back up into China. And these individual cats have a huge range. And you'll, you'll certainly hear more about that from the, the true biologists and experts as you interview, interview them as well. One of the, another product from this, um, this project is a snow leopard management plan. What, what exactly is that? That is an effort to really secure the entire snow leopard landscape by creating landscape management plans that stretch all the way across these 12 countries and cover as much as possible of the snow leopard range. So there are 23 landscapes that are officially designated landscapes that are a part of this global snow leopard ecosystem protection program or the GSLEP which is an international body that was started by the Kyrgyz president to, to really politically secure these landscapes uh, and to create collaboration, transboundary collaboration around protecting them. Because as I was just talking about in Nepal and India and China, you know, it's a transboundary species. It, it, it's really important to coordinate across these different countries. And so one of the things that we've been working on as part of this, this work uh, with USA in this project is to create a model landscape management plan for uh, a landscape in eastern Nepal. Uh, and we've also 
done it in a way that explicitly accounts for the impacts of climate change, because we know that if you just address snow leopard biology in a vacuum, that you're going to you're going to miss out on a lot of really important threats and some of the most detrimental threats. You know, it's, it's really important to include things like climate projections uh, for how precipitation patterns and, and warming is going to affect these areas and, and how in turn that affects community livelihoods and and local species. And then we get all that information together in, in this in one document. And then that forms an important sort of research base. And then with that base, you can develop uh, actions that form the part of the management plan. And the idea is that you know, the next phase is to, is to actually fund and implement those activities to address all kinds of different both threats and land use planning and, and a variety of different issues that affect both the snow leopard species, but also people and, and other important wildlife in that same habitat. One of the challenges of adaptation is that not everyone is quite sure what they mean by adaptation. And if you look at the United States, how adaptation resilience is evolving it's it, it represents one thing, and I and I look at what you're doing over in, in Central Asia. It must mean something else. And in this management plan too, how would you I guess quickly categorize what are some of the adaptation actions? And and I think in the big picture, it's not like you're helping the snow leopard adapt to climate change. There are other pieces that you're helping with at, with adaptation. Is that accurate? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, uh, you know, the way that I the easiest way for me to understand it is. As a sort of a necessary sufficiency problem, meaning that one of the most important things that we can do from an adaptation perspective for wildlife and ecosystems is to reduce direct anthropogenic pressures, things like logging or habitat encroachment or pollution or poaching, because that allows that system to better respond to the direct impacts of a warming world, of changes in precipitation patterns. But that's not enough. It's not sufficient. We also need to go a little bit farther uh, into updating management plans for those species so that we're explicitly accounting for uh, a future of climate change. So for me, adaptation is a very, it's very simple. It just means explicitly looking at how the climate is changing both now in other words, how has it already changed in recent years and how is it going to continue to change into the future? And that's why, as part of this work, we've we've had the privilege of working with climate scientists at, at Columbia University as part of this partnership uh, we have called ADVANCE, which is, which is unique in the sense that we're working with climate scientists to downscale climate projections specifically to conservation areas that we're, that we're working in so that we can get a better sense, sense of what the future is going to be like and then, and then we can plan for that future. So in this case, it was a very real example of taking those projections and incorporating them into the landscape management plan. But then there are also plenty of just like no brainer activities that make a lot of sense, both in terms of addressing those those sort of unsustainable land use trends, but are also helpful in, in building resilience in an ecosystem. So take a, a perfect example of this is, is some work that we've funded in Pakistan, where, you know, all across the Himalayas, landslides and erosion are a huge problem because you have such steep slopes. Naturally, it's a huge problem. It was a huge problem 100 years ago. It's going to be one well into the future, but it's it's being made much worse because of these rapid extreme uh, storms that we're seeing now increase in, in frequency and intensity. And so that can contribute to a lot more erosion. Well, it's also being worsened by overgrazing uh, from livestock. So you get this, this conjunction of, of two factors where uh, climate change is, is causing more erosion, but also those landscapes are being denuded by, by some unsustainable grazing practices. So we've been working with, those same herders to, to actually grow fodder crops on those hillsides um, at important times of the year when the rains are the heaviest so that it actually can stabilize them. So you have much less of a risk uh, of a big landslide or, or, or massive erosion. Okay, so I have just a few more questions. Sure. And what was your favorite thing about this project? Uh, <laughs> I, I think it's, it's a very innovative and everybody uses that word all the time, not to, to, beat a dead horse there, but I think it truly is in the sense that it's working across multiple different fields. You know, you're, we're, we're bringing together different worlds that historically have not really worked well together, um, different sets of expertise and into one kind of cohesive, uh, approach, you know, from, 
snow leopard biologists that historically were very focused on the biological aspects, you know, literally in, in the DNA of that species and climate scientists that are, that are focused entirely on looking at literally what's happening in the clouds in the sky and then combining that and bringing these, these groups of people together to truly create conservation plans and interventions and actions that, that really uh, help people adapt and that can also build some resilience in a landscape. So for me, it's just been fascinating to try and work across so many different fields to try and create something uh, cohesive and impactful. It's one of those rare cases where I feel like, you know, all of my training in grad school that seemed all over the place is actually coming together into one to one stream and then being used in one place. Now that the project is wrapping up and beyond this podcast, how do the results of this project live on i'm assuming you set things in place but how, what do you see now it's not this neat this stops now it's a five-year project but how do you explain that it will live on one of the one of the ways that'll live on is that we've 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 tried to make it really easy and, and accessible for people to access all of the, the the reports and science and information you know i spent a lot of time building out a uh, working with partners to build a uh, an interactive mapping website that really does explicitly make these connections between water flows and snow leopard habitat and climate change impacts. And so that's one way. That's that's a pretty cool site. I'm super biased, but I think it's well worth checking out. People want to look at that. It's the, the third pole geolab.org. And there's some really interesting sort of science and, and um, things you can check out there to really understand better what these linkages actually are. Um, but beyond that, you know, the, the work will continue. WWF has has a presence in a lot of these countries, and we're going to continue to support conservation efforts in them. But there are also there are new, entirely new projects that are following uh, in the footsteps of this one to to ramp up in in different parts of the range. You know, the UN Environment Program is uh, is involved in a project that's very similar around biodiversity conservation and climate change adaptation, more focused in Tajikistan and Uzbekistan and, and Central Asia. So I'm really, you know, I'm hoping that that we've created a model for how to to really work across these different fields and bring bring them together into to a planning and 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 conservation and adaptation approach that you know that that makes sense. Is that that's the only way that you're actually going to be able to ever really you know, ensure that these species continue to survive in a future that's that's so direly affected by extreme changes in climate. You know, this is one of the most vulnerable places on Earth uh, where climate change is happening at two and three times faster than, than, than other parts of the world. So there's a lot of change there, and it's going to require a lot of us to get together to, to figure it out. Did you ever read Peter Matheson's A Snow Leopard? I did. And I had the privilege of reading it while I was trekking in the Annapurna Conservation Area, which oh, is nice. where he actually started. And it was one of the most sort of profound, surreal experiences of my life. I was I went trekking on on the end of the the season, and there was almost nobody up there. And so I had these these sort of very you know I'm not a I'm not a very religious guy, but these very spiritual moments of, of just kind of being up in these mountains and, and I could I could easily sort of imagine myself following in his footsteps. Well, that's awesome. And you you had a unique experience to read it in such a location. So I'm, I mean, I'm reading it right now and I, I'm, I'm jealous. Yeah, yeah, it's a great it's a great read. And that's another guy that didn't actually see a cell leopard in a while. <laughs> Well, on that note, Ryan, thank you for the great work that you're doing. And, and I, following you, I'm going to have some of these experts that you've been talking about, and they're going to share some more insight about the snow leopard and some of the adaptation work. But thanks again for the work that you're doing, and thanks for coming on. Absolutely, Doug. It was a pleasure. Hey, adapters, welcome back. Right now, I am talking with Dr. Yuan Li, a postdoc researcher with the University of California at Berkeley and with the organization Panthera. How are you, Yuan? Yeah, I'm good. How are you? Great. You are an expert on the snow leopard. I was hoping that you could maybe give a little bit more background of your area of expertise on this species. I did my PhD in China. I studied the basic ecology and uh, conservation strategy of snow leopards on the Tibetan Plateau for my PhD. In my postdoc, I mainly focus on the global range-wide snow leopard conservation strategy. How did you end up focusing on the snow leopard? Was this your own personal preference or did your academic advisor lead you that way? 
I think I'm very lucky. One night, at my second year of my PhD, I need to to select my topic, my PhD thesis topic, and just right at that time, George Shuler, the famous、uh, world famous. Scientist, wildlife scientist, plans to start the snow leopard research in China with my PhD advisor Lu Zhi. So I just follow them and start to to, to study snow leopards. Dr. Shaler, he's he's famous for, I guess, accompanying Peter Matheson, the author of the Snow Leopard. Did you actually read that book? Yes, I have read that book. It's a very interesting book. Are you in contact with him whatsoever? Yeah, we contact mainly through email sometimes. Okay, great. So, could you tell me a little bit about the organization Panthera? I think that am I pronouncing it right? Panthera. Yes, Panthera is one of the biggest NGO who focus on the 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 science and the and the conservation of all the big cats. Okay, and so obviously what you do is very relevant to what they're doing. You shared some research that you've been doing, looking at the impacts of climate change in Central Asia, and this is obviously an area of where the snow leopard is at. Could you so this, could you talk a little bit about the conclusions from that paper? Yeah, in the paper we found that there are three. Actually, there are three large continuous. Snow leopard habitat, which is stable during the past glacial and the and the interglacial cycles,、uh, which is in the Altai, Qilian, and Tianshan, Pamir, Hindu Kush, Karakoram mountain ranges. So about one third of snow leopard、uh, habitat is stable,、uh, but the air the snow leopard habitat in Hengduan Mountain and the Himalaya area, so which is the Southern and the eastern edge of snow leopard range is vulnerable to the current global warming. Okay, and so you have this threat of global warming that's impacting the species now, and then it'll be a future threat. But you also talked a little bit about some of the other threats that the snow leopard is under. Well, what are those? So the main threats to snow leopard includes the habitat loss. Habitat fragmentation and another main threat is poaching, poaching and the retaliatory killing, which is sometimes intertwined with each other. These are the two main threats. So I've had someone on from Russia and from Nepal, and they talk about the snow leopards because this whole area of Central Asia is very interesting. A lot of countries adjoin that, and they, I asked about the attitudes toward the snow leopard within these countries, and I'm curious what. Is for China. What does a snow leopard mean? Is it something that local people are hostile to, or do they take pride in? Yeah, I I did the research on that in my PhD. We found that actually snow leopard is not so the attitude of the local people to snow leopard is not negative. The main reason is snow leopard does does not is not one of the biggest pests to their livestock. So they. The the wolf and the brown bear, these two species, they cause a lot of loss to local herders. So the local herders hate a lot to these two species. But snow leopard only the their the depredation of snow leopards to their livestock only account for、uh, less than ten percent of their of their total livestock. So snow snow leopard is not a big problem there. And、uh, their main、uh, attitude to snow leopard is kind of neutral, or and、uh, sometimes is a little positive. Well, that's encouraging. Recently, the snow leopard was, and I, I don't know the exact terminology, but downgraded with its threatened status with the IUC, IUCN. Please correct me if I'm wrong. And I'm just curious, as a researcher, there, I think there's a little bit of debate out there if they should have done that.、Uh, did you have an opinion on on that delisting, or it's not complete delisting, but saying that it's not as threatened as they thought it was? Yes, it snapper was、uh, classified as endangered, and now it is vulnerable, but they, they're still threatened. For that, I'm kind of so you know, snapper is. Live in the remote area. So till now, actually, we do not have very solid data to sh- show their abundance, their population trending. But the current the downlisting is based on the best estimation of the of the best available data. So I think we could wait a little bit for 
another maybe five or more years. So there, there are many uh, current researchers around doing snow leopard research around the, around the world. So maybe after we wait for uh, about maybe five or more years, we will have better data to, to say that. You have actually seen a snow leopard multiple times, right? Yeah, about nine or ten times in my PhD, yeah, during in the field. That is pretty rare. I think Peter Matheson in his book, The Snow Leopard, I don't think he actually even saw one in, in the wild. And But he wrote this great book about it. And I just, could you share, because most people who, when they see a snow leopard, it's at a zoo, which is a much different experience. Maybe you could share a, a few anecdotes of how you saw him. I mean, was, was there any particular encounter that really stood out or is it, you just saw them off in the distance. How did, how did that work? I saw them a couple of times. I think one the main difference between my trip and Peter Matthews' trip is I I just live there for for about months. So I wear the same clothes, the same pants, the same hat. I walk the transect every day, the same transect every day. So I I guess the snow leopard will will find that I'm not, I'm just part of the environment. I I will not threaten them. So they just show up. The the first time I met snow leopards, that's actually, that's the, I think I'm very lucky. That's the, my first time, my first field trip to study snow leopards with George Schaller and uh, my supervisor, PhD supervisor Lu Zhi together. Uh, it's 2009. I remember, so I, when we climbed together up to the top of the mountain and I climbed faster than, than them. And I found there's a very big cave there. So I, I, I walked, I stand at the entrance of the, when I ap- approached the entrance of the cave, I saw there's there a very fresh dead body of blue sheep just just at the entrance of the cave, and it's bleeding so very fresh. I'm kind of it's kind of scary, so I did not enter the cave. I just stand outside of the cave, and I shouted to Josh Allen and the Luigi. I said, "Come up, come up! There's." <laughs> fresh dead body of blue sheep i'm kind of scared come up <laughs> and i just stand against a, a big rock at the entrance of the cave and wait for their coming and the one they're they're appo- they were approaching me i think about dozens of dozens meter away i heard a, a very loud sound just behind me i I wonder, I, I guess maybe it's a, a very big eagle or something. But just one second later, I found there's a big snow leopard jumped beside me. So I know, I, oh, wow. I realized that I guess when I was trying to approaching the cave and snow leopard found that and, but, but she, uh, he did not want to, Want to leave the his his food, so he just hide on the rock. Oh wow! But he found that I do not I, I didn't plan to leave, and I asked two other people came. So finally, he decided to rush uh, uh, run away. So he so he was on the rock just behind me, two meters away, I guess, and he jumped beside me about two meters away. And run away. Wow. And I shouted to, I shouted, snow leopard, snow leopard. And my, uh, Lu Zhi was holding, holding his, her camera in the hand. So he just, uh, hold the camera and press the button. So we're, we were very lucky and captured the, that snow leopard. Wow. And so is, it was a good photo. You got a good photo out of it. Yeah. We, we got a lot of Sarah. Dozens of photo of him. Yes. So when it's jumped like two meters away from you, were were you still in that sort of scared mode, or by that time did you sense that he wasn't planning to attack? Actually, I was. I didn't think anything 
uh, <laughs> I, <laughs> I, yeah. But after that, after the whole experience, when we go back to our to our camp, we were kind of digesting what was happened in. And, and I'm, I was a little scared. So maybe, so usually snow leopard did not attack people, but you're approaching, you're, you're disturbing he, his, his food, his meal. So maybe, maybe he will attack me. I, I don't know. Wow. When you see snow leopards at zoos, you know, they're, they're pretty gorgeous and they're, I, I would, I don't want to describe it, in good condition, but w- was the snow leopard just this majestic looking thing or was it scruffy? I mean, did it seem healthy? Yeah. They, they're, so this time I didn't see that clearly, but I have a couple of other times to see them very, very near about, they did not run away. So I could see them. Clearly, so in snow leopard in the wild, at least uh, the snow leopards I encountered seems wow, pretty, yeah, very pretty, healthy. Wow, you have <laughs> you experienced some things that most of us would kill for, and I think that's really interesting. As you said, this is part of your research that you kept going out, and you, uh, as you described, you think just familiarity because that snow leopard even though you didn't see it was seeing you over and over that's basically what your takeaway is why they ultimately got comfortable enough so you get close yeah i think that's 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 the main reason that's very important you have to live there for at least one month and to 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 let them be familiar with you well, yeah, I guess tourists going into the area, their 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 chances of seeing a snow leopard aren't very good if if that's what's happening. Mm-hmm. Well, that was an amazing story, very exciting, and uh, I <laughs> so wish I had that experience, but that's great, and I and I appreciate you sharing a lot of this information. And is there any sort of final message on any exciting research or anything that you think the public should know about the snow leopard? Although snow leopard has been downlisted, but I uh, but they are still threatened. So I, one, one research I'm study I'm working on is I, we found that snow leopard is the, one of the best surrogate species in this area. He is the, it is the best uh, flagship species, umbrella species and keystone species. So I think to protect snow leopards, we could protect the, the rich biodiversity in this region and also the hot water on the Tibetan plateau. So it's very important. We could keep to, to put resources to conserve snow leopards. All right. Great message. I appreciate it. And thank you so much for the work that you're doing. And thanks for coming on the podcast. Yeah, thank you. Hello, adapters. In this segment of the World Wildlife Fund Snow Leopard Podcast, I am talking with Dr. Ghana Garoon, the Senior Conservation Program Director at WWF in Nepal. Hi, Dr. Garoon. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Hi, Doc. Thanks for coming on. I was told that you have a pretty amazing story when it comes to snow leopards, and, and I really wanted to share that with my listeners. And so You're doing work with WWF, but could, could you maybe talk about that story from, I guess, when you were younger to what you're doing now? Uh, when I really grew up in the mountains of Upper Mustang in Nepal, uh, between the age of five to age of ten, I had a constant. I was herding a little goat and sheep, uh, and occasionally yak with my grandfather, and also studying a, a little bit Tibetan text in the caves with uh, my monk uncle. So that's how I grew up. And the snow leopard was uh, uh, the biggest enemy for us because it was threatening our livelihoods, uh, killing our sheep and goats and everything. So, and that's how I grew up. Uh, despite as a Buddhist trainer, had a compassion. Uh, everything was told that interdependentness and interconnectedness of all life forms, yet it was making us very, very angry because it was threatening our livelihood. And that was the beginning of my life. And then as I moved on for further studies, kind of more value on it. So rare, uh, so important for mountain ecology. Uh, and uh, as I got older to know more about it, then I thought it need to, pro- to be protected because it is uh, uh, the mountain ecology. It's our own future is connected to it. And so the only way to protect is working with the local communities to solve the human snow leopard conflict. There's some form of a compensation to be provided to the local people so their relations can be improved. 
So your family, as you just described growing up, that the snow leopard was not looked at fondly. Do many of your family or just people that you used to live with, do they still have negative feelings about the snow leopard? What's the situation now? Do they look at what you're doing now and are they a bit surprised? No, they are much more better aware of it. Uh, in the nature, it was very limited people, herding community, more following Buddhism philosophy. They are pretty much tolerant to it, uh, despite they're angry, but they were never thought of eliminating the species. And at the moment, even people are more educated, more aware of the importance of the species and becoming really now seeing them uh, under the eyes, how it is, its habitat is disappearing under the impact of climate change, how prey base is disappearing. So people are becoming more tolerant. And, and also there are people like us, uh, a lot working on it, lots of conservation institutions, the government of Nepal, community groups, who are all working to reconcile the differences, uh, providing some form of compensation for the losses. So there's awareness, compensation to the losses, and strengthening the understanding of Buddhism, philosophy of bringing, having the all life forms together. All those are multiple factors that are playing a role and people are much more tolerant. And then there's also a awareness on the, the illegal part of it, which is more deterrent. If you kill a snow leopard, you can be jailed up to 15 years imprisonment. And that is also legal part. People were unaware of it early days. Now they are also aware of that. So combination of all those factors are playing a major role. So uh, and, and the species are relatively doing better, uh, despite the impact of climate change, which no one can actually stop. Uh, that's a major concern at this stage. Okay, so a, a lot of folks see snow leopards for the first time at zoos. And I'm just curious, have you actually seen the snow leopard frequently when you're going out and even when you were younger? I mean, what's that, what's that experience like? Oh, I've seen a lot of them. Uh, they killed my uh, sheep. I actually got, I actually, <laughs> once I had to held, uh, hold on to their tail, <laughs> the oh, little really? one. So uh, it is pretty much uh, almost seeing every winter. You will see a few times all the time because uh, they, in the winter, food gets scarce. And then they, uh, when there's heavy snow, they get closer to the herding, uh, herding corrals uh, where they can actually feed on livestock. So I've been seeing them regularly, even uh, until recently I was seeing them. The last time was in Kanchenjunga, which was 1980, 90, 2013. Uh, we, I didn't see the snow leopard was so far away because my eyesight is not that good, but I saw the uh, fresh pug mark just walked away. So I had a photo taken, which is now on goes on the news. And so, yeah, I've been seeing them quite occasionally. Yeah, well, you're very lucky to have that experience. The this threat that I it seems like that you've worked through with the, the people there starting to appreciate the snow leopard, but a threat that is now coming up is climate change. And I'm I was hoping that you could sort of describe how is that manifesting itself and how does that factor into the work that you're doing with WWF. The climate is a major change because uh, what is happening in the Trans Himalayan uh, area uh, where snow leopards live mainly, the pastures are getting really degraded because uh, we have a prolonged droughts uh, and then harsh winters. So the combination of those two are very bad uh, for the habitat of the ungulates where they could get killed, mass killed in the winter, in the harsh winter, and, and the spring and the summer, particularly the spring prolonged drought, they will suffer uh, because of, there's no grass to uh, graze on. So those uh, factors are playing major role. And also uh, the domestic animals are the one that snow leopard been feeding on. So the diet of snow leopard uh, from 15 to as high as 40 plus it constitutes the domestic livestock. And when your domestic livestock goes down because the loss of pastures, in my own village, my uh, still my brother uh, actually hurts his uh, his goat. And we don't have a yak now anymore because yaks are all uh, gone away most of the place. There's only a few families. Uh, one family in my area keeps a yak. We, we, we used uh, like six, seven, eight, nine families used to give yaks. So that loss of a domestic, which is also food for snow leopard, and the loss of the uh, prey base, which is all natural prey base, which is also under harsh climatic conditions, are major threat to the snow leopard. And it's not only snow leopard, it's causing major uh, threat for the little settlements in the mountains where the water is small river streams, which are regulated by snowfall, permafrost are slowly drying out and people need to be resettled somewhere else, or they have to abandon their settlements. 
Uh, and in my own village, that's what's happening. My relatives have resettled. And my own sister is now about thinking about it because water gets so scarce. Even little irrigation irrigation fields, we have little patches which you can already grow one one crop a year through, through irrigation, which they cannot do anymore. Uh, these are the major challenges which are recently coming up. Uh, yet uh, the other side of it is like some of the villages we've never been able to grow apples, but now they can grow uh, big apples because the change of temperature where you can actually have irrigation uh, can be done. That is some other crops like a, a vegetable crops, some apples, all things are you can grow because of that, uh, the temperature changes. So the, on the other side, it's actually a very harsh uh, climatic conditions made much more harsher uh, under the climate conditions. It's my understanding that you are doing some adaptation work. And could you just describe what does that really mean to do adaptation work in your neck of the woods? Uh, basically, the adaptation work is the the first one is the uh, the pastures are getting more and being integrated. So it's actually having systematic uh, rotational grazing systems been uh, placed in, uh, put in place. So you will not really run into total degraded uh, uh, grazing land. So you have a rotational grazing to be made more systematic. There are little the uh, water catchment areas are better protected under forest cover where your moss can be maintained and water can be better regulated for the uh, natural system as well as some irrigation to be done and other human use. And then there are lots of a high altitude. We're using a little, we call it plastic tunnels or greenhouses where you can grow lots of a new forms of vegetables, a varieties where it's a good nutritional intake. You can grow fast. And at the same time, you can sell the surplus to the tourists. Uh, these are also that. And then some places which I'm talking about, the Mustang, my village, lots of people are growing trees, which are good timber source, good fuel source. And at the same time, it's green. it, it greens the whole system. And then uh, also doing all, all the like planting apples, uh, which are, are good now growing as a good cash crop. So all, and changing the housing systems, a bit of a slanting them, because when you get a rain in a one go of pouring rain, uh, we have a that, so that also leak, um, leakages happens a lot. So the rains can be run away. So the little, little things which are uh, part of the adaptation uh, and also uh, making a plastic ponds or little water recharge ponds where you can water can be better regulated uh, in, the, in the natural system as well as for human use. So these are uh, little uh, adaptation changes uh, which we are doing it and also protecting the local seeds uh, because local seeds are much more resistant some of the local varieties so making sure that some seeds being protected instead of always going in a hybrid and, and a high production seeds uh, so that some seed banks being created and people are more aware of the other uh, uh, the diseases that are, are emerging, so better connected with the agriculture department. Uh, so they are uh, able to get information what's going on on that. And climate stations being also put, so we can mo constantly monitor the climate uh, stations, the humidity, temperature, and so forth. And that is also linked to the schools. So schools can actually, students can learn from it. They can communicate their parents, uh, farmers. So there's a, a two-way learning system put in place. So there are lots of things what we do part of the integrated uh, community and ecological uh, uh, adaptation, I would say. That's more important, yeah. Okay, one last question. And so it seems like you've made tremendous progress getting the, the people there to appreciate the value of the snow leopard, but now that you have this emerging threat of climate change, do you feel like you might take some steps backwards, or, or some conservation groups actually see adaptation as an opportunity to create a new sense of urgency to protect species? I mean, what's your sense of things? Do you sense more conflict coming between people and snow leopards, or are there adaptation efforts you're doing actually maybe going to uh, have people appreciate the snow leopard even more? I think to me it is pretty much human nature when you are put in push into a certain uh, certain uh, age, and you will become much more aware of it. Once you become much more aware of it, you do uh, things better uh, for the betterment. Uh, uh, otherwise, people t things take uh, taken for granted. In this case, because of the already uh, climate the uh, the poor conditions of of the environment, which is further degrading. Uh, under the climate impacts, people are much more aware of it. So it's not only survival of the snow leopard, which is at the back burner, 
but it's their own survival and connectivity to it, to the health of the ecology under the development with lots of roads coming up, lots of minings coming up, lots of our development developments coming up. And one of in our area, it's, uh, tourism is also part of it, major part of it. So all these de- development uh, economic drivers have an uh, impact on the ecology, and ecology it has to be maintained. So it's more people are much more responsible and sensible towards that. And I see a bigger, better future because the urgency added by climate change has actually created a much more uh, people's uh, uh, energy to do better. Uh, so the, uh, because the unpredictability is getting higher. So there you really need to be better prepared. So better preparedness has created a lot of energy to move uh, towards uh, uh, not only conserving the uh, snow leopard and its ecology, but also as a whole development, make more resp- responsible and, and sustainable. I would say it's a, it's, uh, even large infrastructures or uh, linear infrastructures infrastructure is making much more ecologically responsible or green infrastructure, smart green infrastructure that we call. Our people are moving towards it and it's not only the high politicians talking about it, our people and the ground are much more aware of it because they are the ones who are suffering the brunt of the impact. Okay, well I, I wish you luck in what you're doing. I appreciate all the, the great work that you're doing there and I hope someday that I can go on location and maybe you can show me a snow leopard in the wild. That would be such a treat. But uh, And on, on that note, thank you so much. Any final words? Uh, thank you for getting me on the lines on your cast because this is also going to add uh, addition to the awareness generation of the larger audience and in the places like in the uh, in Nepal and uh, in and other side of the world, lots of resources, investment comes from this part of the world and and uh, North America and Europe and others. So knowing more about it is actually the investment on that adaptation work or community work. Uh, uh, developing better partnership and understanding actually gets better. So I'm grateful that you are doing that, and that will help us to uh, have a more global uh, understanding of the issues that we are facing in the uh, back home. All right, great message, and thanks again for coming on the podcast. Thank you. Hello, adapters. In this next segment of the podcast, I am talking with Dr. Oksana Litka, coordinator of the Climate and Energy Program at WWF in Russia. Hi, Oksana. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, Dad. So what is your role at WWF Russia? I'm a specialist in climate program. Mainly, I deal with with climate adaptation issues, climate vulnerability assessments and uh, climate adaptation projects for species, ecosystems, protected areas in Russia and also in Central Asia. That's a huge area. Is it just you working in, in Central Asia and Russia or is there a bigger team there for WWF Russia? We work in several places in Russia, in our ecological regions, in Arctic, Caucasus Mountains, uh, Far East, Altai Mountains, Barents, near Barents, and uh, near Chukotka, near Kamchatka. And in Central Asia, we work uh, mainly in mountains and uh, in all five countries. This episode is about the snow leopard, and but it's also about water security in, in Central Asia. And so... Uh, What's happening in Central Asia regarding climate change? What what are some of the impacts? In high mountains, we have large glaciers, uh, which are uh, huge water, natural water storage. But particularly, Kyrgyzstan did the assessment and they understood that because of this warming, they have uh, even more water than previously in their rivers. But in very short time, 20 or maybe in 30 years, they will have lack huge of water. Uh, countries downstream, Amudarya and, and Serdarya, they suffer because lack of high quality water and enough water for irrigation even now. And uh, you should know the story about the Aral Sea. Uh, that was one of the largest saline sea in the world, but now it's almost totally desiccated, the main part, and only another part because of dam was restored. But this is a tiny part of the previous large lake. So it's because that all water from the Serdarya River was taken to people's needs. You just explained some of these water issues associated with the impacts of climate change, but it what kind of competition is there between people and biodiversity in Kyrgyzstan? Competitions, how to say? This is 
glu- this is warming and uh, drying of weather led to drying of uh, steps and uh, <clears throat> and this is a problems for livestock we are not talking about fields which are downstream and they are irrigated we are talking about sheep goats horses uh, so uh, people need to get enough food for them so they uh, need to use other places with good grass up to up in mountains and so they try to use uh, territories which uh, previously they didn't use for pasturing and uh, which are traditional territories of snow leopard and it can cause people uh, wildlife conflicts so in Nepal, it seems there's been a kind of a flip to it, and you can't say this for everyone, but the snow leopard, I think, is a source of pride for a lot of folks in Nepal. Is that true? Does your average uh, Kyrgyzstan person look at the snow leopard as, you know, is it something for tourism? Is it something a point of pride, or is it just kind of out of sight? In Kyrgyzstan, snow leopard is, how to say one of the symbols of the country okay. and of their high mountains and high mountains for people uh, always were sacred places and uh, snow leopard like in Russian Altai Russian Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan is something like a sp- the spirit of their high mountains so this animal is uh, very important for them traditionally. Such cases of uh, people and wildlife conflicts previously they were very rare so and now um, they are not uh, often in all parts in Central Asia. Yes, it can be. Also, we uh, have other issue that the uh, skin of snow leopard is uh, very expensive, and uh, of course we have cases of poachings. But very often such poachings are not local people who live there and have uh, their stocks. Uh, very often such uh, poachers came from uh, other cities and other places. And we work together with uh, local communities to prevent such cases of poaching and not let uh, poachers to reach places where slowly apart occurs. Well, I have a couple more questions for you. You shared a paper with me about adaptation planning in Kyrgyzstan. It was, it was a really interesting paper about what's going on there and what really stood out. It, is it sounds like there's a lot of planning going on, but the funding available to actually implement the adaptation planning is an issue. And I'm wondering with the COP meeting going on in Bonn right now, will Central Asia benefit from additional funding for adaptation implementation? As all the developing countries, Central Asia countries need more money than they have. So this is reality. So we have the reality of uh, that the climate change affects them uh, badly and uh, um, high population, high density of population and uh, not uh, large adaptation capacity of these countries. So you, you can see from their side, they do everything that they can. And they did a lot of researches and they uh, did their uh, own plans how to adopt to climate change in different sectors, in agriculture, water security, also forestry and conservation. But the, country, uh, the countries has, uh, have money only for a small part of these plans. And, uh, of course, they need uh, support from other countries. And uh, they have uh, large hope for Green Climate Fund and for uh, <coughs> GF to uh, get such money for development, uh, for conservation, and also for not, not only for adaptation, also for mitigation to improve situation. So Russia is this incredibly large country that borders some of these Central Asian countries. Is Russia doing a lot on adaptation implementation? Uh, traditionally, Russia support. Such in these countries, and uh, also from, for example, through the channel of official development assistance. But uh, money which Russia can provide them are not enough. They need also other additional sources. And in that paper, you you kind of did an assessment of how the Kyrgyzstan is looking at adaptation in the in the energy sector and infrastructure. And there was a section on in biodiversity, and it didn't seem like there was a lot going on. And so, how do you see the snow leopard benefiting from uh, even if funding came in for adaptation planning, let's say in Kyrgyzstan? 
Uh, for snow leopard, uh, yes, this is prevention of uh, new people wildlife conflict. This is one side of the coin, and uh, other side of the coin, establishment of new protecting areas and uh, ecological corridors for migration, not only for snow leopard, but also for their prey, uh, because uh, ungulates are much more vulnerable for climate change, and for example, summer droughts than snow leopards. Okay. Well, you certainly have uh, uh, your work cut out for you. I appreciate you coming on the podcast, and thank you so much. Thank you, Doug. Hello, adapters. In this segment, I'm talking with Dr. Sharu Mishra, the Director of Science and Conservation at the Snow Leopard Trust. Hi, Sharu. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, Doug. Thanks, and I'm excited to be here. Well, it's great to have you on. And just so for my listeners, where am I Skyping with you from? Where are you based at? Currently, I am in Bangalore, India, and I pretty much based here, and I travel to the uh, snow leopard habitat from Bangalore. Excellent. So you are the director of science and conservation. So what does that do? What what, what is your job? Uh, well, I my job is a easy one. We have these fantastic teams across most of the snow leopard range countries, the most important snow leopard range countries. I mean. They're working in India, China, Pakistan, Mongolia, and Kyrgyzstan, where we have our field teams. And we um, also engage with the governments of all the 12 snow leopard range countries. And my main jobs are to support our great teams. I help uh, guide some of our uh, snow leopard research work. I mean, uh, Snow Leopard Trust has some of the longest uh, and all the research programs, including long-term monitoring of snow leopards, their prey and their habitats, as well as we try and design community-based conservation programs and engage with uh, governments on policy matters. So it's a bunch of various different kinds of initiatives, and my my job is to help design some of them and support our teams in implementing them. I've already talked to several snow leopard experts, but we've had different conversations. And just for most Americans, and, and a lot of my listeners are, are from the United States, we, we have a general sense of what a snow leopard is. But I'm, I'm just wondering if you could quickly describe, really, what is a snow leopard? Yeah, sure. I mean, this is a this is a fascinating species that lives in uh, this region called High Asia. So we have, it's a predator. It is, you know, you might be, some, I, I think what comes closest to the snow leopard in terms of body size and some of the habits might be the cougar. But snow leopards are really high up in these extreme uh, cold environments in the higher Himalayas and the other mountains of South and Central Asia. They are very well adapted to living in a very cold environment as well as it's an almost vertical environment they live in. They, they really like to live and hunt in extremely rugged and broken mountains. And they are actually very, really well adapted to that habitat and they largely are, have evolved to prey on these wild sheep and goats like the blue sheep and the ibex and the argali. Now, again, for for your American listeners, maybe, you know, think of the Rocky Mountain goat or think of the bighorn sheep, you know, species like that that the snow leopard largely hunt. And they also end up killing a fair number of livestock because they share their habitats with uh, livestock rearing people. So in a given day, how far is a snow leopard traveling? And I guess there are differences between male and females. Yes, that's a, that's a great question. There are indeed differences. So if you look at the, let's say, first look at their annual home ranges, Doug, they would be moving, uh, they cover areas of maybe, the males may be covering areas of more than 200 square kilometers, sometimes several hundred square kilometers, but let's say 200 square kilometers plus minus at a minimum. And then you have the females, which have slightly smaller home ranges, maybe uh, 160, 170 square kilometers plus minus. So they are, they, they need large, large spaces. And typically in terms of how much a cat might move on a daily basis, it's variable. You know, if, if a snow leopard has made a kill, it would like to hang around the kill for a few days, uh, at least three or four days. But they may move anything between a few hundred meters to maybe uh, 10, 15 kilometers in a single day. 
That's quite a distance. I've gone to the Snow Leopard Trust website, and it's actually a really great website. It does such a fantastic job sort of describing what you guys do and where you're working. And it talked about these multiple countries, and you had mentioned that earlier, that this is high Asia, you know, high Asia countries where the snow leopards, it's in these multiple countries. And I'm just curious, are there any interesting differences between the snow leopards within the, the different countries? Is there behavioral differences, or is it all pretty standard? Again, a great question, Jag, and like many other aspects of snow leopard biology and ecology, um, the simplest answer is we don't know. But the, you know, I mean, many of these areas have very different habitats. Like in the Himalayas, you have these animals largely using areas of, you know, between three and a half to maybe about 5,000, 5,200 meters above sea level. In Central Asia, you know, parts of, let's say, the Gobi Altai, you find them as low as 800 to 1,000 meters above sea level. So just imagine the kind of differences. It's like, you know, uh, high mounts, comparing high mountain people with almost comparing people, you know, with, with people living in, in the plains. So there, there would be, uh, you know, differences in their adaptations, we, we could assume. Similarly, the kind of uh, prey, the prey assemblages that occur in these areas, the prey they hunt, are, can also be very different in these between these areas. I mean, on the one hand, some areas are dominated by the wild goats, like the ibex, and ibex are really they they love these extremely steep and broken habitats. In other areas, they would largely be hunting wild sheep now, and wild sheep, as you know, they they use they like to use more rolling kind of mount they they're still in the mountains in these parts but in relatively more uh, rolling habitats so i guess the hunting skills involved in both these are slightly different uh, so yeah so that there, there should be differences in in their biology and ecology across sites but we're really not sure at this point in time and if you look at it, really, the um, there's not many places where snow leopard ecology has been studied very closely. And the only, perhaps, the only exception is our long-term ecological study in South Gobi of Mongolia, where we've been following radio college snow leopards since 2008. So far, we have close to 24 snow leopards that we've radio collared, and uh, you know, we, we've been tracking you know, their lives for now, what, nine years? And that is unprecedented. I mean, that's, that's more snow leopards, uh, many more snow leopards than all the other studies ever conducted across the world. So the, the point I'm trying to make is that we there's still much more research to be done for us to be able to understand um, their biology and ecology better. And studies like the one we have been doing in South Gobi of Mongolia they need to be sort of replicated in other parts of its range. Related to that question, you really have this unique opportunity with the snow leopard. It's it's showing up in significant populations in these different countries right next to each other in high Asia, and you're involved with multiple countries. Are there countries that are more successful at, let's say, conservation or adaptation planning in regards to the snow leopard than others? And do you look to those models and try to bring them in maybe some other areas? And, I, and I'm sure the political environment and the sort of social environment all plays into that. But I'm, I'm wondering if you could speak to – oh, well, this country does things really well. Great question. And so I think it's been all these countries try. Most of these countries have, uh, you know, a lot of uh, the governments are placing currently a lot of emphasis on on economic development, on poverty eradication. Let's, let's make, uh, you know, uh, let's be clear about that. Uh, conservation is not a priority and perhaps, you know, in some ways from the political perspective, understandably so. So, it is a challenging environment in general to work in, you know, for conservation. But at the same time, you know, different countries, the models of conservation, you know, it's not a one all encompassing model, Doug, but the kind of initiatives people have tried out. Many of our teams in these various countries, team members in these various countries that, have, that they have tried out. Some of those, how it goes with conservation, you really need to be experimenting, trying to work with communities, trying to work with local governments and see how best you can, you know, protect the environment. So there's a lot of experimentation that's going on constantly. So there are, you know, across these countries, there are different kinds of models that we have learned from 
And because of this unique ability that I have and the Small Leopard Trust have, because of our you know, work in multiple countries, we've actually been able to facilitate that knowledge exchange. Now, for example, we have this, we have this really successful and flagship program called Small Leopard Enterprises, where essentially, which is focused on the women. Uh, in the herding communities that live in small leopard habitats. And the women are, uh, you know, wherever they are willing and uh, they request our, you know, our cooperation and help, we are able to train them in producing uh, internationally marketable handicrafts using mostly local produce. And then it's, it's a conservation program which essentially also helps the women with some uh, livelihood opportunities. So could they create these handicrafts and then they uh, we are able to procure them and use our partners to market them. And the community, the entire community actually signs a conservation contract with us. And if like no small leopards are killed, no poach, uh, no prey is poached, and if their you know, uh, habitat is not um, damaged, then all the producers get a 20% bonus. So there's sort of a positive incentive to conserve in this program. Now, that is a program that started in Mongolia, but then we were able to expand it. It worked really well. We were been able to expand it to Pakistan, to small leopard habitats of Kyrgyzstan, uh, India. Similarly, we have, let's say, we started a community-based livestock insurance program because, like I said, snow leopards and also wolves, they kill a lot of livestock. And so it's, it's hard for the communities to live with them. And that's one of the important reasons why there's a uh, fair amount of retaliatory killing of snow leopards because, you know, livestock are and the most important resource for these communities. And, you know, uh, snow leopards are sometimes involved in what we call multiple kills. So if a snow leopard manages to enter a poorly constructed livestock corral, sometimes few, maybe two, three, and sometimes 10, 20, or even 50 goats can get killed in a single attack, in a single night, which, which, which can be really devastating, as you can imagine. Uh, for the farmer, both economically as well as uh, psychologically. One of the programs that we have that we've actually piloted and started in India is on community-based livestock insurance, where farmers are able to, at a small pr uh, premium price, they're able to insure their livestock, and then they can get compensated for if the livestock is killed by snow leopards. And that's a program then we were able to expand to um, other countries like Mongolia, China, and Pakistan. So there's always this constant kind of, uh, you know, exchange of uh, ideas and uh, programs that is possible when, you know, one's working with an organization like this. So I have talked to researchers from Russia, China, and Nepal, and I, what I've asked each of them is, how do those individual countries, like the, the local people, the sort of on-the-ground people that are, you know, within the range of the, the snow leopard, what do they think of the snow leopard? And I'm just curious, in India, is it sort of a nuisance animal, or is it something that's held in high regard? Good question. And once again, you know, if you look at, I mean, and, and I think I speak for most of our countries, not just for India, there are, you know, the, the responses are, um, and it's, it's a mixed bag. On the one hand, it is a source of inspiration. Snow leopards figure in um, some of the uh, local folklore. And in fact, you know, when the great Guru Rinpoche was supposed to have been spreading Buddhism from India to Tibet, he said that he um, carved out these sacred valleys or Shangri-Las from these mountains and and that the if there was sort of any is you know any person with a bad intention was to approach this try to approach the Shangri Shangri-Las it was the snow leopards who would confront them and turn them away at the mountain passes so you know so there's this whole sort of mythology and uh, spirituality associated with the snow leopard on the one hand and and also it's sort of looked at as a symbol of strength but on the other, it is it is very understandably also looked at as a pest because you know for the for the especially for the livestock damage that they do. You know the nice thing with snow leopards, or rather the, the easiest thing about snow leopards is that they're very very rare cases. They usually don't attack people. They're extremely extremely rare and exceptional cases when a snow leopard may have attacked a person. So the the problems are largely related to livestock predation. And then in some cases, as you know, you know, I mean, we are humans after all. So there's a, there is a demand for their pelt 
and for their bones. So again, there it sort of sometimes viewed as a potential source of income for a few people. Okay, so I just have a couple questions left for you, but this next one I think will <laughs> take a little bit of time. So climate change, the, the impacts of climate change are starting to be felt all throughout high, you know, high Asia. And I'm just curious, what are some of the adaptation efforts that you're involved in? And you're probably getting sucked into more than you realize, but it, it's just the nature of what, what's happening now. So what are some adaptation projects or initiatives that, that are going on in, in, in where you're at? One of the interesting ones and, you know, which has been developed actually indigenously, not by us, but by some very visionary people, local people in Ladakh has been this whole idea of um, what they call artificial glaciers. And the idea being that, you know, uh, where, where snow leopards occur, actually, as you know, while on the one hand, they are sort of... Um, there are areas where a lot of these rivers that feed, you know, more than a billion people, uh, they, uh, the rivers originate in snow leopard habitat. But at the same time, the landscapes are relatively dry. They are high up in the mountains, relatively dry landscapes. So water is a limiting resource for people. Uh, one of the, one of the things that we have been experimenting with is have these people, have these uh, people from Ladakh We've had them recently or sometime back travel to Spiti Valley, an important snow leopard habitat, where they have basically, um, the local people have tried to learn these skills to create artificial glaciers. The whole idea is that you uh, select these uh, slopes where, you know, it's like on the northern side of the mountains where it's possible to divert and store some water towards the end of autumn. Uh, and that water slowly sort of freezes and you're able to sort of create these glaciers, which, uh, you know, when once the spring and summer starts approaching, slowly it starts melting and provides a more sustainable water source for people, for irrigation, for livestock and other things. So that's one of the things that one of the programs that we have been sort of um, involved in trying to assist people deal with their issues of water security. Otherwise, we're placing right now, there are a lot of emphasis on trying to understand what sort of, uh, what kind of patterns do we expect and what climate change is likely to do. And one of the things that we're realizing is that, as you know, the intensity of these extreme climatic events, that is, appears to be increasing, you know, many parts of the world and definitely in high Asia. You know, these sudden floods and, you know, uh, cloud bursts or extreme winters, et cetera. And the, it's, you know, so that's sort of becoming the background, the baseline. And I think what we do uh, against such a background, over such a background is extremely critical because if we are still going to be opening up building roads in the most vulnerable habitats or vulnerable areas, we're going to... Cr- basically intensify the problem. So the, or the kind of uh, industrial development or mining, a lot of these kind of things that are increasingly taking place in snow leopard habitats. Once there is, you know, their effects are going to be interacting with the effects of climate change. And the, we suspect that the ultimate results going to be really devastating, not just for the wildlife and biodiversity, but also for the people. Some of the important things that we've been trying to do is to try and work proactively with the government as well as with the industry to encourage a more green kind of development model in high Asia, in these mountains, particularly in snow leopard habitats, where the, on the one hand, the impact on the environment is much lower, uh, the negative impact on the environment and habitat. And, and on the other, that there is a space for in the development planning, there is a space for conservation of snow leopards, biodiversity, and wildlife. So they they go hand in hand. It's not like, you know, they're always trying. It's always one against the other. And that is the that is the uh, dialogue we're trying to change right now. Well, so my last question. So you've seen a snow leopard in the wild, correct? Uh, Yes, I have. Okay. And and I've asked (laughs) this with other researchers. in, In this, I think... Most people will never see a snow leopard in the wild. I'm just wondering if you could sort of describe just kind of quickly, I guess, what is your your most interesting or sort of inspiring snow leopard encounter? Actually, my uh, most inspiring snow leopard encounter was earlier this year. And, well, 
there were two encounters and both were special. The first one was special because my eight-year-old son, Shivi, was traveling with me and we were lucky and he was incredibly lucky to, at age to be able to see a snow leopard. There was a snow leopard that had made a kill and we watched the snow leopard for about um, five hours together. Wow. That, yeah, that was spectacular. <laughs> and on the same trip, about two days later in a different place, I had this, I mean, I've never had such an experience uh, in my life. It was, uh, Shivi wasn't there. He was back in the village and I and my old friend from the village and colleague, Chile, we were we had gone out in the snow because we'd seen at a distance of about a kilometer, about two kilometers away, we'd seen some ibex on the slope that were alarm calling and sort of running around and stuff in a kind of suspicious way. So we thought we must go and check it out. And it was incredible because we, it was a bit of hard work wading through that snow. But then finally, we had this snow leopard. We had this encounter where the snow leopard was like 10 meters away from us and uh, she was looking at us and we were looking at her and it was like a surreal experience. And the, the, the most wonderful thing was that she wasn't really particularly concerned or too scared. She just one jump and then she slowly walked away and sat about 75, 50, 75 meters from us. She kept watching us and we kept watching her for a long time. And we actually watched her for about two and a half hours. But it was evening and it was starting to get windy and cold so we had to leave her alone at that point in time and come back but it was, a, it was an amazing experience wow two great stories i'm sure your son will have that for the rest of his life if he doesn't go out and do what you do that's that's fantastic <laughs> well yeah this has been fantastic i appreciate you sharing this information and just thank you for what you do but uh, uh, good luck to you and just i hope you keep seeing the, the snow leopards that their, their populations you're able to to help conserve them Yes, I hope so too, Doug. Thank you so much. Hello, adapters. In this segment, I'm talking with Judy Oglethorpe, Senior Director, Multilateral Program Development at the World Wildlife Fund, U.S., and until recently, the Chief of Party of the Hario Bond Program in Nepal. Hi, Judy. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, Doug, and thanks so much for having me. Well, it is a pleasure. So a little bit of background on you. You're, you're based in D.C., right? But where are you from originally? I'm originally from Edinburgh in the U.K., but I actually have not lived there for a long time. I spent a while working in Africa before I came to the U.S. to join WWF. And then for five years, I more recently, I was working in Nepal on the Harry Oban program. And how long have you been working at WWF? I've been working in WWF for the last 20 years. Okay, so that that's a long time at one organization. And I, I'm just curious, how long have you been working on adaptation issues? Uh, I've been working on climate adaptation for um, a, about eight years now. Okay, so that's a lifetime. I'm always curious of different people working on it, because some people say they've been working on it for 30 years, and I think they're just <laughs> tweaking on what they originally were doing. So eight years is actually, you are a seasoned vet in, in the field, so it's good to hear. All right, so I want to jump in. You lived in Nepal until very recently, and I think you lived there for five years, and I want to talk about that. So why exactly were you there? I moved to Nepal in 2011, um, to run the Hari Oban program. Hari Oban in Nepali means green forests. So this was forest project that was working in two large landscapes in Nepal. The Terai Arc landscape, which is in the lowlands of Nepal, in the low-lying areas near the Indian border, uh, with tropical forests and grasslands and animals such as uh, tigers and rhino. And then the second landscape was the Gandaki River Basin, which uh, drains from the high up areas on the Tibetan Plateau coming through the high Himalayas. The landscape includes the Annapurna Range, the Langtang Range, Manaslu Range, over 8,000 meters, and then all the way down through the mid hills um, to the lowlands of the Terai. Okay, so what about the people? Can you, uh, even basic information, the population, the ethnic diversity, I mean, is it a more rural society? Could, just some of that background. Yeah, Nepal has a population of around 28 million at the last census. Many people still live in rural areas, although there is a, there is a movement to cities and also a lot of people migrating out of the country for work, especially men. 
but still very many people living in remote rural areas, you know, because of the huge altitudinal range in the country, many areas are not very accessible. They're only accessible by foot and you may have to walk several days to reach some of these more remote communities. Uh, so we were working mainly with people in these remote rural areas who are, you know, living in areas where the forests are, are doing well. But, you know, living in situations of, of quite a lot of hardship quite often, you know, in tough climates, in remote areas, often doing agriculture on fairly marginal land. So these were the kinds of people that our project was, was helping. In Nepal, there are many ethnic groups and many different languages are spoken. There are people who've moved in from the north and also people who've moved in from the south. And then there are the people who, who were there longer, the, the ethnic groups like um, the Sherpas in the north, um, near the Everest area, and the Tarus in the south. So huge ethnic diversity. So did you speak the local language? Uh, I learned a bit of Nepali, not as much as I would have liked, because many people in Kathmandu do speak English, and everybody in my office had good English. But yeah, I learned a little bit. Now, as I was preparing for this podcast, I, I read uh, The Snow Leopard by Peter Matheson. I, I, I don't suppose you ever read that book. I have read it. It's a wonderful book. It is. And it's a very interesting book. And um, I, we don't need to go too much into the book. But as you read it, I think it was written in the late 70s. And you just get the sense that very quickly you are like in the middle of nowhere. And I'm just trying to get a sense of like it's, you know, it's 30, 40 years later. Are there still those kind of remote areas? There are still remote areas. I mean, it, it always amazes me that, you know, many of them do have people living in them. But uh, yeah, no, Nepal still has very remote areas. Now, is the country pretty stable, politically speaking? It, I mean, is it a government in flux? Things are evolving. Uh, there, there was a new constitution in 2015 just after the earthquake happened. And as a result of the new constitution, Government is, is actually being reorganized at the moment and very much decentralized down to more local levels. Um, so, but, but yes, there's a whole progression in Nepal as a, as a republic and with the, the coming of democracy. Now, the earthquake, we obviously have to talk about, if you could give a little bit more background on that, it happened in 2015, and it was just this massive event. Um, could you give a little detail? And it, are, are you sort of since saying that that event itself led to these changes in the Constitution, or was it something that was already happening? No, the Constitution was already under development. It may have been a bit accelerated after the earthquake, people coming together, but it, no, it was a work in progress for a long time. The earthquake itself, it was a 7.8 on the Richter scale, the, the, wow. the, the first one. Yeah, so it was huge. It tragically um, it, uh, resulted in the deaths of over 8,000 people and many more injuries. Destruction over, of over half a million houses, many other buildings, uh, a lot of landslides. So it was, it was quite devastating. What we're talking about on this podcast are snow leopards and climate adaptation, and you are an expert in, in adaptation. And, and I want you to describe what are, what does climate change really mean for De Nepal, and you know what's happening now and what's likely to happen. Sure. Okay. So uh, our project actually worked with a lot of local communities to identify their climate vulnerability, and then work on plans to for them to adapt to, to climate change and build their resilience. Some of the main things that people are seeing now are changes in the way that it rains or, or snows. Rainfall is much less regular. People can't always tell, you know, when is the monsoon going to start? When is it going to finish? When should they be planting? And also the pre-monsoon rains, which people are very dependent on for early agriculture, um, they're also more variable. And um, if they fail, it means that the, the weather gets very hot and dry and there, there's more likely to be forest fires. But these changes in rainfall are affecting people's water supplies. It's also raining differently. People, people say that it's raining much more intensely now. When it does rain, there are these huge rainstorms with a lot of runoff, which means that less water is actually being soaked up by the soil and, and um, going into aquifers, more flash flooding. So people's water supplies are affected, uh, people's crops are affected. And then because this rainfall is more intense, 
there are more landslides and more soil erosion. And those sediments and, and debris, if they get washed into rivers, they're carried downstream. They're deposited further down when the, the rivers level out. And these sediments can also cause problems. They can cause rivers to shift course and affect people's water supplies lower down. They can block irrigation canals and so on. Another impact that people are talking about is uh, increased diseases and pests as temperatures start to warm um, you know, new organisms are coming in where they didn't occur before. There are, I mean, there are also some gains. You know, people are saying that some crops are not growing so well as they did in, in some places, but in other places they're growing better. So, for example, apples are growing better on higher ground. Um, they're growing in in Mustang district, which they where they never used to grow before, but they're not doing so well lower down anymore. So, in a previous conversation, you had mentioned this this concept verticality and in a place like Nepal uh, it seems very relevant but what did you mean by that? Nepal has very distinct um, altitudinal zones altitude zones um, you know different vegetation grows at different heights people grow different crops uh, and have different types of livestock at different altitudes land use varies and uh, we realize that you know the different zones all affect each other. Um, if you take a, a watershed, for example, we can work with the community, a local community, on helping them to adapt to climate change. But if we aren't working with the people upstream from them, those people upstream may do something that affects them adversely. For example, if the people upstream are losing their water supplies, they may put in a dam on the local river, which helps them solve their problems but means that the people living downstream get less water. So we really have to make sure that there's communication and collaboration between the upstream and downstream uh, people so that they can find the optimum solutions to using natural resources. We can't just anymore just plan at a local scale and think we can solve all the problems. We actually have to go wider than that to work at the scales that these um, ecological processes are working at. So as with, I think, any country, even the U.S., there's awareness that needs to happen regarding climate change. And you talk about these impacts. And before you even get into adaptation strategies, is the national government doing any national awareness activities or even the project that you were working on? What, what, how did you communicate climate change to the people on the ground? For the people who we were working with directly, before we went in to do um, adaptation planning with them. We would go in and uh, provide information directly about, you know, what is climate change. We'd work with them to do vulnerability assessments to see how they were vulnerable. But we'd start off explaining, you know, what, what is causing some of these changes uh, from, a, from a global level. Um, very often they'd observe the changes, but they weren't necessarily aware of what was causing them. Um, but another mean, another way of communicating that uh, worked very well was local radio. Many people in rural areas, they don't have access to television, but very often they have access to radio. And so we did several radio programs to, to do outreach about climate change, but also to help people understand the kinds of measures they might take to, to be able to adapt and build their resilience. Okay, so I want to talk a bit about adaptation in Nepal, and that's, I, I think it's directly linked to the, the project you were working on. But so can you elaborate what, what's going on there? What was some of the work that you were doing over those five years? Okay, well, I, I had started to talk a bit about the community adaptation we, we, we work on. One of the things that happens in Nepal is that people are, are vulnerable to climate change in different ways, and some people are more vulnerable than others. So when we go into a community to start working, we would um, first of all think about, you know, who's going to be most vulnerable. And quite often it's women, women and, and poor people and and people who are marginalized by the rest of society in, in, in their communities. So, you know, these might be people who have lower education, less knowledge, fewer assets to tide them over shocks um, because because they're very poor. People who may not be able to participate in community processes because they're excluded by other members of, of their community. Um, people who are pushed out and maybe living in more marginal sites where they're more prone to flooding or landslides or they have less good land to farm. 
Um, and then people who whose resources are affected by climate change. So women, for example, manage water in, in Nepal for, for the household. And uh, water is one of the one of the things, water supply is one of the things that are most affected. Women are also less mobile. They may not be able to swim if there are floods. So for all these kinds of reasons, um, different people are are more vulnerable than others. And so we'd, we'd make sure that those people could participate fully in the process. And very often it meant empowering them empowering them to speak up in meetings, empowering them to understand what their rights were um, so that they could participate fully in the process and the planning around climate adaptation could make sure that their needs were, were being addressed. So, so at community level, this was, this was our process. We do the empowerment, the vulnerability assessment, and then the, the, do the planning. And then we'd uh, provide some funding for implementation. And we'd also help the communities to find other ways to fund their plans if, if the plans were beyond the, f the funding scope of, of our project. Very often, for example, they raised funds from the local, local government authority or in some cases, community forests generate their own funds and they were able to put some of their own funding in as well. So that, that's at the community level. And then we also, as I, as I mentioned, you know, we found that we have to work at a higher level. So we, we also started working in, in uh, water catchments uh, and bringing together the communities, the upstream and downstream communities to produce a plan for the, for the whole catchment. You're obviously probably familiar with the notion of microfinance, and it's been sort of talked about as a way for women empowerment. You give them more options and such. And it sounds like you're you're kind of doing that with the you know you do a vulnerability assessment, you have these workshops, but is there some adaptation tool that really is targeted at women and, and to empower them in response to this? And, or I mean, you sort of described all those things that you're doing, but is it really packaged and targeted toward women? Yeah, so the initial empowerment that we do, the, um, we, we set up groups called community learning and action centers, and we bring together these poor women and other marginalized people, men as well, if they want to participate. And they, they meet for a number of weeks. They talk about their issues. They learn about climate change. Uh, they, they learn how to participate in meetings. It, it builds their self-confidence. And then we go on, you know, we do go through the, the process. And in some cases, we may have a grants program that's particularly targeted to them, maybe grants or it, it may be, uh, as you mentioned, microfinance, revolving funds. And we, we found even within these groups, sometimes they would save their um the money that they were given for snacks during this meeting, they would save that up. And even although it was a very small amount, they would put it together as a fund and then use that as their internal revolving fund. So, yeah, microfinance plays a very big role in helping people to um, build their resilience, um, improve their lives. Well, I wonder what the cultural situation, you'd mentioned that, you know, you have these meetings that women can attend and the men can attend too. I had one guest on where she did work in the South Pacific and she'd go into these remote islands and she led these adaptation workshops, but she would have women only adaptation workshops and then they'd have men only, but then they would come together when they actually did implementation and it, it just was a cultural thing, but it actually was more effective. And do you even need to consider something like that in Nepal? Yeah, we, we would do focal uh, focal groups, fo focal discussion groups. Um, so, for example, in the vulnerability assessment, we we might um, talk separately to the men and to the women, and have them identifying the vulnerabilities that that uh, they were experiencing, and then bring them together uh, and you know look at prioritizing what actions should be included in the in the plan. You seem like you have a multi pronged approach to adaptation work there, and, and that's fantastic. And I'm just curious what are some of the biggest obstacles. So you're there for five years and there must be recurring things that you're just like, all right, we can't get past this or this is a major obstacle. What, what were those things? I I think some of the main obstacles, well, we were learning as we were doing this. And, you know, while working at the community level was really important to find out about this differential vulnerability and, you know, really being able to get down and, and helping the most vulnerable people. At the same time, it, if it was independent of the local government process it, it it didn't tend to go anywhere and there was a risk of the plan sitting on the shelf once the project ended so what we were starting to do by the end was scaling up these um, individual community level plans taking groups of them and 
working with the local government authority to mainstream those plans, those results into the local government planning. And the advantage of this was that it, it would get mainstreamed into the local development plans and also funded by local government. So we realized that while, you know, going right down to community level was important, we also had to come up to local government level um, in order to, you know, have some kind of sustainability for climate adaptation. Um, so that was that was one thing that, um, you know, was going slowly, but uh, was sort of by the end moving in the right direction. I mean, some of the other challenges are, are just the fact that you know, access is, is difficult in the country. So getting to these remote communities to be able to work with them, um, developing their trust and confidence, uh, it all takes time. And um, five years sounds a lot, but it actually isn't a huge amount of time. We were very lucky in that um, our donor, US Agency for International Development, gave us a, a second phase of the project. So the project is actually continuing now. Um, so it's it's continuing to do uh, biodiversity conservation and climate adaptation. It, 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 they continue to fund it, so it, it's still going to, even though you returned, it, it's one of those projects that will keep going. Yes, that's correct. So, I mean, how much longer? How, do, how long do these sort of funding windows? I think when people think of these international aid programs, it's like, oh, is it a two-year funding window? And you were there for five years. I mean, I think that we had talked before that it's a the, how these things succeed is long term. And so is, is that next phase a, a decent amount of time? It's another five years, which is great. So which um, puts the project ending around um, 2021. Well, I have a few more questions for you, but we had mentioned this earlier. And I want to talk just again briefly about the, the earthquake that hit. And it was obviously this massive human tragedy. But I'm sure all sorts of aid flooded into the country. And I'm just curious in regards to adaptation planning in the country, what were there some positives that came out of that? Yeah, I think there were. Um, it, after the earthquake, when, when um, well, our, pro our project took part very early on, we were able to divert some funds for immediate relief. And so we were working with the communities. Uh, we had par been partnering with before, taking in relief materials and so on. And then we we were fortunate enough to be given some additional funds to help with uh, earthquake recovery and reconstruction. So we worked with um, our partner communities. And as we were working with them, we were able to, uh, you know, sort of help them to think a bit about future climate impacts and, uh, you know, how they could um, make adjustments as they as they did reconstruction um, to allow for climate change. You know, thinking about flood levels, for example, and that these might get worse in the future. Were there things that they could do to rebuild a little bit differently? Where people were rebuilding houses, you know, could they do enhanced water efficiency? When they were rebuilding irrigation, could we have slightly different designs that would would um, use water more efficiently, for example. And we were also able to work a lot across other sectors as well. We realised that one of the biggest environmental impacts that was likely to happen from recovery and reconstruction was through all the building that had to go on, you know, over over half a million houses destroyed, many government buildings, clinics, 8,000 schools and so on. You know, so thinking about where is that where are the raw materials going to come from? Um, encouraging people not to cut down trees on steep slopes, which could cause landslides in the future. You know, you re reuse and recycle as much material as possible. Don't dig sand and gravel and stone from environmentally sensitive areas. So we were able to work with several um, government ministries, you know, different sectors to promote an environmentally responsible practices. You know, we we had the slogan, you know, building back better and greener. And as we did this, we also talked about climate change, you know, thinking about we're not in a static situation. The goalposts are moving and they're going to go on moving, you know, thinking about what we can do about more erratic rain, higher temperatures, greater floods, more risk of landslides in the future. So in a way, that was uh, there was an opportunity there to also promote um climate adaptation. Although having said that, you know, obviously when people are scrambling to rebuild and the country is, um, you know, and there's, this, there's a, a, a lot of 
disorganization and um, funding challenges and so on, it's difficult to get people to think of something extra. But if you can, then it's it's a huge opportunity. Well, my last question for you, and now that you've been back, um, well, you're not originally stateside, but you are stateside. What do you miss most about Nepal? Because it sounds like you, you love the country. So what what do you miss about it? I I miss my colleagues. I miss the people. Um, Nepalis are a really wonderful people to work with. Uh, and, and we had such great times. I, I also miss the landscapes, you know, being able to go out and actually seeing the Himalayas or seeing the forests and the, and the rivers in the Terai, um, and, and of course the wonderful wildlife. Uh, that's what I miss. This, all these different conversations I'm having around this episode, it's just, it's very fascinating. And, and after reading Peter Matheson's The Snow Leopard, I feel like there's a sequel to that that needs to be written. I don't think anybody wants to fill in his shoes, but you guys have all done these very exciting things. And so filling in a lot of gaps because people learn so much about Nepal from that book. And, you know, it's been such a long time frame. So. I guess, you know, I don't know if I'm encouraging you to write that sequel to it, but it it would be great in that sort of format to kind of learn more about the country. Yeah, I mean, there is a lot to learn and, and we're still learning and things are transitioning so fast at the moment as well. Well, thank you so much and thanks for what you do. Well, thank you very much. It was a pleasure talking. Hello, adapters. In this segment, I'm talking with snow leopard enthusiast Theo Perlin. Hi, Theo. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, Doug. I'm happy to be here. Well, it's great to have you on. I know you're you're calling in from a vacation. You are one of my younger guests. Can you tell me a little bit about yourself? You know, what grade are you in? Where are you based out of? I am a 15 year old from Seattle. I'm currently a sophomore at Seattle Academy of Arts and Sciences, and I have been holding bake sales to raise money for snow leopards for six or seven years now. That's pretty remarkable. So why are you such a big fan of snow leopards? Uh, Well, it started when I was in fourth grade. I had a service project assigned, and I had really read a lot about snow leopards in the news and on conservation websites. And the Snow Leopard Trust, which is based in Seattle, was based right by my house. So I'd learned a lot about snow leopards before, and I'd really become interested in protecting these beasts because they're so beautiful and they're so special to our environment and to have them go would just be such a shame. So I became really interested in trying to save them by any means that I could contribute. It's it's an older book, but it, it, it must have come up in all this work that you've done. Have, have you read Peter Matheson's The Snow Leopard? I have not, actually. Well, I highly recommend it. It's considered a classic, won a lot of awards, and it's been a recurring theme in this podcast that I'm doing on snow leopards. But basically, Peter Matheson travels to Central Asia to try to go find a snow leopard, and it just talks about his journey. And he ultimately doesn't see one, but it, it's still become a classic. So, you know, maybe it's a book. I'm sure one of your high school teachers would be thrilled if you read it and talked about it. But on, on that note, so you've, you've held these fundraisers. Now, tell me about the fundraisers. What is involved with that? I've been holding uh, bake sales for about six years now. I didn't hold one last year because uh, I've begun holding them in uh, sixth grade, I believe, with a friend who had also been holding bake sales from the Snow Leopard Trust so we could sort of consolidate all of our baked goods and uh, hopefully raise more money that way. But she had left for boarding school, so I decided not to do one last year. But So basically, we just baked a ton of stuff like cookies, pastries. We're both very talented and uh, experienced bakers, so that's how we decided to raise this money. And then uh, all the proceeds we personally delivered to the Snow Leopard Trust. Well, I'm sure they're thrilled to have some younger members of the community doing such a thing. That's fantastic. Your inspiration, I would hope my son would do something similar. You know, I have a couple more questions for you. You obviously know a lot more about snow leopards than your average 15-year-old. Has the issue of climate change and its impact on snow leopards come up? Are you learning about that from the Snow Leopard Trust? Is it is it something that you're concerned about? Yeah, I'm certainly concerned about climate change because it definitely forces these animals that have a much smaller and smaller environment, also just other human impacts, hunters and farmers are forcing them into a smaller and smaller space and really restricting their growth and definitely making their numbers diminish. So I think that human impacts are definitely the greatest threat to snow leopards, especially climate change. Great answer. And do you have any expectations of ever seeing a snow leopard in the wild? In the wild? I highly doubt it. <laughs> I don't think... 
I will ever travel out to Mongolia or another country that has these beasts. And if I did, I also highly doubt that I would be in a place that I could see a snow leopard. However, I do see them a lot at our uh, Woodland Park Zoo in Seattle. Well, I love that answer because you're a realist. It really is quite hard. I have people who travel to Central Asia and go looking and they still have never seen one. And so you're, you're very practical and, and yet you're still inspired to, to try to conserve the, these species. So that, that's, that's kind of interesting. Yeah. I mean, I would love to see one. However, I highly doubt that I will. And I think that because even though I can't see these beasts in the wild and I have just seen them in zoos, I've still read so much about them and I've learned so much about them. And I've really like gained that sense that they need to be protected by some means. That is a fantastic answer. I think hopefully people will be inspired by that. Well, thank you so much. And I hope you keep it up. And I, I hope you restart that fundraiser just because I think it's it's an ongoing thing. And quickly, what's the, the biggest seller with your fundraiser? Ooh, I believe it changes every year, but it's usually the cheese scones that I bake. Oh, the cheese scones. We, I might ask you for that recipe that I can include in my show notes. You can, you can answer for that later, but the, the, that might be kind of a fun way to include that. On that note, thank you for what you do, Theo. I hope you keep it up and hope you have a great school year. Thanks for coming on. All right. Thank you, Doug. Hello, adapters. In this segment, I'm talking with Matthias Fichter, communications manager at the Snow Leopard Trust. Hi, Matthias. Welcome to the podcast. Hey, Doug. Thanks for having me. Well, it's a pleasure to have you on. First off, what is the Snow Leopard Trust? The Snow Leopard Trust is, the, I think, the world's oldest and largest organization that's dedicated exclusively at protecting and conserving the snow leopard in the wild. You're, you're based in Sweden, correct? I personally live in Sweden. Uh, the Snow Leopard Trust's base of operations is in Seattle in the States. And then we have teams spread out all over Asia in five snow leopard range countries, plus a couple of people here and there, including myself and some, some other people that are also based in Sweden. Now, so I, and the reason I ask, you have people like connected with what you're doing all over the world and I get why some of them are located in the snow leopard areas, but is there, is there any uh, logic to this model that you guys are literally spread out over the world, just different roles? Sweden is a coincidence. Okay. Um, we also have a couple of people living in the States outside of Seattle, which is also largely due to just private reasons, family, things like that. Asia, on the other hand, of course, is is due to the work. And this might seem like a bleeding obvious question, but why do you think snow leopards are so popular? We have this whole organization, the Snow Leopard Trust, that's focused on protecting them. And I was thinking about this. You know, why is it popular? It's obviously a gorgeous looking animal, but it's a species that most people will likely never see in the wild. So why do you think it's so popular? That might actually be part of it. I think it's a it's a charismatic animal, and it's it has an air of mystery around it, precisely because you. You can never see it. Even the people living in snow leopard habitat often call it the ghost of the mountain because even they might in an entire lifetime not see a single snow leopard. And at the same time, it's it's an animal we're very familiar with. It's It basically looks like an overgrown fluffy cat with a longer tail. It's, it's very cute, more so than probably most other big cats. It just looks gentle. It looks like something you would as a pet, which of course is a horrible idea, but it's, <laughs> I think it's easy for people to, to see this animal and be drawn to it. So the, even the book, uh, Peter Matheson, the famous book, The Snow Leopard, ultimately he did not see a snow leopard in the wild, and yet it's become this classic book. I think that probably uh, relates to what you just described. Exactly. Um, some, of, some of it, of course, is that it's just an excellent book, um, which would have worked I think in a different setting with a different species as well. But of course, the mountain landscape where the snow leopard lives and where the book is set also adds to that. It's, I think for many people, it's a, it's a spiritual place. It's the roof of the world, um, geographically, but it's also, I think, a special place for many people in their minds as well. Okay. So snow leopards are a threatened species and there's different categories that you can list them, but they've been dealing with threats like poaching and habitat loss. So how has the Snow Leopard Trust adjusted with climate change becoming more of an impact for the species? I think climate change is one of these threats that maybe aren't as direct as something like poaching, where you have a cause and an effect, which tends to be a dead cat. With climate change, it's more that this is impacting every other threat and every other aspect of 
coexistence between animal and, and humans. So everything we do, every measure we take to try to protect the snow leopard and to try to make it easier for the people in, in their habitat to live with them has to take climate change into account. How will climate change affect the way people do agriculture, the way people raise livestock? Um, the habitat of the cat itself, will the snow leopard go higher up the mountain? Will it come down? Will other animals come into its habitat? So climate change definitely has an impact on all of these things, even though we don't know what exactly that impact looks like for in many in many ways. But it's it's something we need to take into account with everything we do. Well, I want to dig into that a little bit more. You are the communications manager, and I, it it's my experience that a lot of conservation groups struggle on how to effectively communicate adaptation. And so, I, you know, you go to your website and climate change is there. And uh, so in the part of the podcast, we're talking with folks involved with this US, USAID project and adaptation is a big part of, you know, dealing with the conservation of the snow leopard. Do you guys have uh, sort of your own struggles communicating specifically adapting to climate change? It's definitely more difficult than, let's say, poaching. So I think everybody immediately understands what happens there, why it's a problem and, and how to contract it, at least in theory. With, with climate change and adaptation, it's a it's a much more subtle process. It might be small things that impact the way a group of people lives. And it's it's much more difficult to explain how in change, in, in turn, that impacts the snow leopard or, or you know any other animal. So I think if you're a conservation organization and you try to communicate the work you do and the threats that, that you're trying to combat, the more abstract it gets, the more complex it gets, the more removed from the animal itself, um, the more difficult it is to to make it understandable to people. Well, I think, like I said, other groups are looking for that successful model. And is, is your, you rely on scientists to give you information on what, what's the status of the snow leopard? What are these impacts? And then, you know, when you talk about climate change, you're, you're getting into like vulnerability assessments. And by the year 2050, X is going to happen. I'm exactly. sure, I'm sure you as a communication guy, he's like, how can I use that? How can we put something on our website? I'm sure that's a big challenge. It definitely is. I think. With the snow leopard, we, we have to go in a direction that's sort of inspired a bit by what people do around the polar bear, which I think is a very, is a very good symbol for the impact of climate change because you have visible impacts on the habitat. That's true as well for the snow leopard. You know, glaciers are melting in, in Asia's mountains. Um, there's frequent landslides. There's droughts, which are affecting, of course, people, but also animals. They're not as, as photogenic and as, as blatantly obvious, um, as what's happening at the poles. But they're still there. So I think we, if we want to get across what's happening, I think we need to work with visuals. Just show it because it's it's there. You can see it with the naked eye. What would you say to my listeners about the Snow Leopard Trust? Like, how what would you communicate about the the work that you're doing? I mean, you've sort of talked about some of it here, but any sort of final message? Right. So I think the essence of what we do is we work with communities in snow leopard habitat. We believe that for the snow leopard to have a future. It has to have a future that includes the people that live in these um, mountains of Asia. Part of it is because the snow leopard uses huge amounts of space, so protected areas alone are just not large enough. And part of it is also that from an ethical perspective, this is a, a shared landscape that belongs both to people and to animals. And for the ecosystem to function, it needs both. And so for us, everything we do um, starts with gaining the trust of local communities and finding out what they need, what their what their um, issues are when it comes to living with the snow leopard and finding solutions for these issues. Okay, last question. Have you ever seen a snow leopard in the wild? I have not. I've um, tried. <laughs> I've spent some time in, in India, in Ladakh, where you have a relatively decent chance of seeing one if you go into winter, especially, which I didn't do. I've also tried in Kyrgyzstan, but I think I need to spend some more dedicated time actually looking for one. On the other hand, not seeing one and still you know, going to work every day to protect them has, has its own sort of interesting mystique to it. Well, actually, that's, I think, a, a cool concept that you're doing the work that you're doing with. Maybe there's an expectation that you'll see this species at some point in the future, although there's no guarantee. I think that's actually a cool, cool thought. It's it's kind of fun. And, you know, our, our former executive director, Brad Rutherford, he 
I think he was the director of the Snark Trust for 15 years or something along those lines. He hasn't seen one in the wild in that entire time. So I think with my five years and, and not being in the field nearly as much as he was, um, I still have some time. Maybe I'll see one in the future. Who knows? Oh, that Peter Matheson book must be very popular w- within the trust. But uh, thank you so much for what you do, and uh, thanks for coming on. Thanks, Doug. Okay, Adapters, that is a wrap to an epic podcast. We covered a lot of ground. I hope you feel like you understand more about this amazing and elusive creature, the snow leopard. Although most of us will never journey to this part of the world, my guest painted a vivid picture of these regions and their own encounters with the snow leopard. In this episode, I frequently brought up Peter Matheson's famous book, The Snow Leopard. It is an epic masterpiece that takes its readers on a journey. Although I would never compare myself to a legendary writer like Peter Matheson, I hope you, my listeners, felt you were on your own Asia High Mountains journey during this episode. Listening to my guests' adventures in these regions was riveting, and hearing of their encounters with the snow leopard left me inspired. That conservation work we only read or hear about is actually happening in tangible ways. Again, for more information on this project, check out the brochure produced by WWF that's in the show notes. Also in the show notes are a ton of links that provide information on my guests and additional information on the snow leopard. And I even included an image capture of Theo Perlin's cheese scones that he sells at his snow leopard fundraiser. Let me know if you make the recipe and I'll let Theo know. Again, this podcast would not have been possible without the extremely generous financial support of World Wildlife Fund and USAID as part of the Asia High Mountains Project. Thank you, WWF and USAID. Podcasts are an incredibly effective way to share substantive information in a conversational way. Thanks for recognizing the role of podcasts in important science communication. Some final housekeeping. Don't forget to join the Facebook page and the Facebook community group. The group is private, but just search for America Daps and ask to join, and I will approve you right away. It's a chance to hear insider info on the podcast and to see what other listeners are sharing on the wall. Some great conversations have come out of that group. Also, I love hearing from you. I say this every time and I mean it. Just say hi or if you have an idea for a guest, let me know. Seriously, it's the highlight of my week when I hear from all of you and it sometimes leads to really cool things. I'm at americaadapts at gmail.com. Send me an email. Okay, check out the website at americaadapts.org. All this information is in the show notes, especially links to that donate page. Okay, adapters, keep up the great work, and I'll see you next time.